Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else. Hey, if this is the first time you're tuning on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up, bringing you a ton of content. And then, of course, if you're listening on the podcast side of things, a rating and review goes a very long way for Mr. Jeff and myself. So in today's podcast, we are going to be doing a Q&A. I had tweeted out a call for questions on Twitter, at Focus Compound, and we have a bunch of uh, questions. So we'll have the screen up right now if you want to follow along. And of course, if you're listening on the podcast side of things, I'll read them out loud. Um, And the first question says, how will electric vehicles and self-driving cars affect Copart's business long term? I don't know the answer to that long term. Um, It's hard to say. So Copart's business over time was kind of set to the market that it was able to address in the U.S. and stuff was kind of going to decline a bit longer term by maybe one or two percent a year or something in terms of frequency stuff with accidents because of improvements that car makers were making in terms of safety um autonomous type stuff but they have been slowly putting it in that we don't think of as self-driving but little things that were making cars safer um that's been totally offset more than offset by people's use of the iphone basically um or cell phones generally and so because of that uh it, the accident frequency is higher especially for some very bad accidents and deaths and things like that so Um, It's hard to say. We should have been seeing a decline in it over time due to the self-driving aspects, and we're not because the human aspects of it are getting so much worse in terms of accident frequency. It's interesting. If you look at their investor presentation, they always show accident rates. I think maybe it was declining, and then Mm -hmm. probably, what, 2009, 2010, when smartphones became more of a thing, they started to rise back up, unfortunately. And what matters to them is totaling of cars. So it matters what the structure of the insurance industry is, but also totaling is more likely for cars that have more more um, expensive stuff in them. So self-driving um, may reduce accident frequency in the long run, but it may increase the totaling rate of cars when they do have accidents. Some very safe cars actually have pretty high totaling rates because they cost too much to fix them. So if you're driving a pretty old um, truck or SUV or whatever that has very little risk to the passenger, it, you actually will do so much damage to it in terms of what they'd have to repair that the co- it's basically total cost. So it could cost thousands of dollars, whereas a, a much lesser car wouldn't cost that. So definitely the rate of totaling things could go up with a lot of um, self-driving stuff. The electric stuff, it's less sure. There's a couple pieces of equipment on electric vehicle that are very expensive to replace and the rest aren't so much. Um, Electric cars, we'll see. Um, Some of them are pretty cheaply made for the parts that aren't uh, important for the electric stuff to keep the weight down and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then there's also ones like Tesla and stuff where that's not true. So I don't have a good idea on the totaling rates. This also applies to things like auto parts, things that we've looked at, like replacements in the aftermarket and all sorts of things like that, everything to tire companies and things. It does change things a little bit. We should point out electric vehicle adoption in the U.S. is, especially outside of California, very low still. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Gus Hansen or Barry, is that Greenstein? I don't know those people. Um, next question. Some darker liquid companies give little info about the stock. PPL speculate that they are trying to keep the share price down and off the radar. I get the bad reasons they would do that. Mm-hmm. to loot the company why do some people think that is good what's a good reason management would want to suppress the share price we actually talk about this a lot jeff yeah the most common reason why management wants to suppress the share price is to buy more of the stock for themselves mm-hmm. um the second most likely reason is uh they want to avoid um disappointing people and or drawing in the wrong kinds of people um i've kind of said that before i someone we were talking about elon musk or whatever and i said that when he said the share price was too high and actually there were a couple other ceos who in the past have said that um the ceo of i don't know they said it in like a letter or something but the ceo of bowl america was concerned at one time that his, people were pushing up his stock price too much and just want not wanting to disappoint them and stuff because mm-hmm. you set the expectations on the road right, right? buffett had that one time we, we've talked to management that has been concerned at times that like something that they thought was a small term change in the business that would have more longer term payoffs they don't like when people treat it like it's this big catalyst that has this big return in one quarter Mm -hmm. i think management management likes a pretty high stock price generally i would say but doesn't like sudden moves up in the stock price and a lot of anticipation of that kind of thing it could be kind of frustrating too as a let's say i think if you're an individual investor i think that's actually great if the management thinks like that i guess when you're managing capital sometimes not only you're managing like the portfolio but you're also managing investor expectations and especially in sort of this overlooked illiquid space, sometimes a company can be doing great and the stock doesn't move. 
And in theory, you should love that because mm -hmm. that gives you an opportunity to buy more and management may be more conservative because they want to buy more as well. But from like a long-term perspective, that's great. What, um, I forget, we talked about it the other day. You were saying that Buffett, I forget what stock it was, but it, it took him four years to, you know, he built a position sometimes in a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then, you know, you have a one or two year massive move and it goes up two to three times. But I think that just really comes down to, um, just focusing on the fundamentals, right, of the business. Yeah, the most uh, common reason is because they want to buy some of it for themselves or buy back uh, their stock themselves. Obviously, for us in general, when we're buying a stock, we prefer that it doesn't draw attention from anyone, that the stock doesn't perform particularly well, all those things, um, because we want to buy more of it. And that's usually their reason for doing it, too. Uh, but the other reason is like the extreme ones. Let's take a really controversial example, but a really extreme one is Big Larry Holdings, which had like a premium built into it a long time ago in terms of who was in it uh, as the management and everything, what he was going to do. And then over time had such a dramatic change from like a premium to I'd say a discount in it that what that did is whatever the performance on the underlying business was, it's extremely different from the performance in the stock over a really long period of time. And, you know, that can happen if you have crazy multiples and things at times. Mm -hmm. So if you have a holding company or something, you might really not want to trade at a big premium to book value. I've talked to some management that kind of thinks in terms of book value and they don't like their stock to be priced at one and a half times book value or something because it they don't like the idea that over the next 10 years they'll have a drag of five six seven percent or whatever compared to what their performance is just from this thing dropping and mm -hmm. then it disappoints a lot of people over time and you know especially when they know the shareholders well some some management know, knows their larger shareholders pretty well and, mm -hmm. and doesn't want to disappoint them how do you go about projecting future changes in working capital? How do you make sense of the volatility in each working capital account on the cash flow statement? One year positive, two years negative, even for established companies like Walmart. Uh, I would always tell people to use a three-year average yeah. uh, free cash flow measure. And you can just use long-term median averages of percentage of a number versus sales. So like what is receivables as a percentage of sales or cost of goods sold? What is a per um, same thing with uh, inventory and stuff like that? So you can get an idea of what it is. Probably as a ratio compared to sales is a good way of doing it. And then always use three-year average free cash flow. Because what's happening is why it's so volatile is you're getting it twice from it. What happened is there's a normal level that it should be but because you're seeing it as of a certain date it was they worked down inventory too low one year and so they have to build up even more the next year to you it looks like that's a really big change in each year but all that's happening is it's wobbling around a mean or a median um, that you could just find that central tendency pretty easily so always use three hours free cash flow yeah it works itself out uh can you explain how intrinsic value grows and moving price targets i think you skipped over this question during the last q a podcast um so, so like revaluing a company when you own it yeah. Uh, so I do revalue and stuff. I mean, technically, I don't if you do an intrinsic value growth estimate, which is like a DCF, it's kind of debatable whether intrinsic value can grow at any rate other than the discount rate that you're using. Because if you are perfectly correct about it over the future and it continues on that correct course, then it should just change by the amount of the discount rate. Uh, that's not how we look at it. I would say we look at it as some measure. So I'll just give you an example. We were looking at banks the other day. Um, a bank that I would use would be a percentage of their asset value, uh, their earning assets, which is basically the same as their deposits. So th that's their securities and their loans. So if the bank um, has an increase in deposits or an increase in their earning assets, either one it kind of depends on how you analyze it, um, then I would change the value by that amount. So say we would be, I would value it at um, 20% or 30% of 400 million in assets, then you do that calculation each year, you figure it out. So in general, if you know deposits per share are increasing at a certain rate, then my intrinsic value estimate is changing by that same rate. But if you're already factoring in the growth, then it's only changes in your expectations that would change the price actually. So that kind of theoretically how a DCF works is that you have to adjust every time the actual year is different from your assumptions, but we don't really do DCFs. How is return on incremental invested capital incorporated in your analysis and thoughts on three statement models and DCFs? Well, we don't really do DCFs. I would say the um, return on invested capital is incorporated into analysis in terms of the inverse. So I don't think in terms of return on invested capital as um, 
what your growth is going to be or as having value in and of itself. I think of it as how much earnings do you have to retain to create value? And a good example is the Buffett test, which is do you create at least $1 of market value for $1 of earnings retained? And for companies that have very high returns on invested capital, that's what they do. We tend to look at companies in which I think there will be some growth and almost no need to increase um, invested capital. So if you look at what we own, it can be things that have float a lot of the times, or it can be things that have already made substantial investments that I think will now be able to gain in revenue uh, afterwards. So like, let's say that something can charge 3% more for tickets to uh, an event held at some place that they already own the venue. Well, then you get a 3% bump up in it without any increase in um, what you own you know, from a cash flow basis. Now, you already own it and it might be appraised for tax purposes. And if someone will buy it, you know, it's market value at that same rate, but you're not putting any more money into it. And so we tend to look at things like that. Um, I, I always flip it around. So I ask, how much can this company grow? Can grow six, 7% a year? Okay. And then I say, well, how much earnings will it have to retain? I don't think a company that has 100% return on invested capital but can't grow is worth any more than a company that can grow. Um, I think it, it's a good way to think of it as the tax, the price of growth. And that's how I do it. Would Jeff buy Russian stocks? And then somebody said, I think in a previous episode, he said he wouldn't. Someone pitched him a Russian stock. And this is true. You did say this, uh, that you did not buy because you're worried about like political involvement. And then that actually happened. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. You said that. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. No, no. That was, the, the, yeah. Someone had pitched a Russian stock and I was concerned yeah. about it with a Russian media mm -hmm. uh, related thing. Yeah. And they had pitched an energy thing. Um, <laughs> so, f yeah. I, I mean, that's a hard one. Uh, I think um, I would generally not invest in someplace like Russia. I also would be extra cautious in any country where I'd be worried anyway about anything that might be considered um, politically sensitive. So things that tend to be regulated and stuff. So energy is a big one that way, just in general in most countries. And then also media, I would always be cautious. I mean, I'd even be more cautious buying a French media company or something than buying a French, uh, you know, radiator company, because one is more likely to have more involvement by the government at times for various reasons than the other. Doesn't mean I want to buy it, but just things like media, banking, utilities, whatever, things that tend to get regulated more often, I would be worried about. Uh, Russia is one of the main countries I wouldn't buy something because there's political risk, there's also corruption risk, and I don't know the country very well at all. Somebody says, thoughts, uh, uh, thought the discussion on special dividends last week was really interesting. Any difference slash preference on companies that give special dividends with zero debt versus buyback stock? I assume measuring buy, buying back stock at below intr intrinsic value is tough. And then he says, uh, I also know MC has given special dividends with zero debt several times since going public nine years ago. Does Jeff have any thoughts on that company, Moalis? What okay. about other boutiques? And then he gave a couple uh, tickers. Okay. But maybe hit the special dividend question first. Sure. So um, the special dividend thing is the same sort of thing as buybacks. It's very interesting if they do a special dividend instead of a regular dividend because that behavior is more unusual. And I like usually... Uh, unconventional behavior is much more something you should pay attention to than conventional behavior. So if your average bank pays out half of its earnings and dividends every year and raises it by a little bit, um, that's not very interesting because all the other banks are doing that. So it tells you nothing about these bankers. But if they're occasionally paying out special dividends when they think they get overcapitalized or something, that's kind of interesting. Uh, or they're paying an incredibly low payout ratio or an incredibly high one or whatever. Same thing with buybacks. If they're timing the buybacks to happen at certain times or at certain prices, that's really, really interesting in a way that constantly buying back isn't. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is least useful is whether a company buys back to offset dilution. Tons of companies do this. It's meaningless. So as like a data point, it doesn't help me evaluate management or capital allocation. Uh, when I mentioned things like Omnicom, though, they do buy back regularly, but they buy back so aggressively all the time that it's almost like you can count on getting a buyback instead of a dividend as just a way for them to use their free cash flow. So it's, it's focusing in on the things that they do that are so unusual. Sometimes I like what they do that are so unusual. Sometimes I don't. Uh, there's some companies that raise debt and pay special dividends or raise debt and do buybacks. That's a private equity type approach. Keep re-leveraging the company up to put it back into the sort of mode it would be if it was an LBO. 
that can work great. People have read The Outsiders, they know about that. Um, but it's whatever it is, it's unique. And so it's worth thinking about whether you like it or not, but it's worth thinking about in a very different way than, co- than most companies. Most companies will not take on a lot of debt to recapitalize. They won't pay out special dividends and they won't time buybacks aggressively at certain times and stuff like that. And some companies do special dividends just to keep their return equity high as well. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So like banks, for example, if their return equity um, start to, you know, get or like, I guess, go down or whatever. If you pay out a special dividend, that's only going to improve your return on equity right. uh, going forward. Because now obviously you're taking it on a smaller base. Yeah. And uh, several years ago, a lot of companies paid out special dividends, mostly family controlled companies and things like that um, be, to take advantage of tax things for the people who be receiving the dividend was going to change from one year to the next or there was concern that it would be. Do you have any thoughts on, do you know this company MC? Uh, we can use QuickFS to see these. QuickFS, if you want to join, <laughs> yeah. make sure you tell them you came for Focus Compounding. There you go. Um, an investment bank provides strategic and financial advisory services in the United States and internationally. It advises clients in the areas of mergers and acquisitions, recapitalizations, yeah. and restructurings. I might look at some of these companies I have written down to look at some that are investment uh, banks as in like advisory firms and stuff more so than um, the kinds of things people think of today as investment banks. Um but there are a couple small ones there. You can look at the economics there. Obviously, the economics are are very good. Attractive, yeah. But how will I understand them is a big question. And without a lot of scuttlebutt and stuff, I'm not sure that you could. But probably with a lot of scuttlebutt, you could. So if people know about advisors for M&A and stuff, it's probably a good area to look into. Um, I can't really see from here exactly what those are, but those are other tickers in the same business, I think, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I recognize two of them. So, uh, yeah, I I've, haven't analyzed a single one for... Um, the website or anything yet but i actually did write down a few that look very interesting on their prices but i just think without having knowledge like inside knowledge of the industry it'd be really hard to evaluate it's a people business and you know got it um snap judgment on chtr okay charter communications right yep okay okay currently trade 60 times earnings Right, but ten years aren't meaningful here, yeah. Yeah, ten year Kager twenty one percent going from seven billion in two thousand ten to forty five billion in two thousand nineteen. Massive growth. Growth through acquisitions. Yeah, growth through acquisitions. You have the incredible increase in assets over time. That's you know unheard of to have an increase in assets that much. You also have a really big uh, level of assets versus equity, and you can see that also with the debt to equity. So it's leveraged up an incredible extent. Um, so that's the tricky part. Uh, you can look at things like EV to sales and EV to EBITDA. Probably the most logical one is to look at EV to sales and then think about how whether they can really achieve certain margins and stuff like that. So EV to sales, we're talking about about four times there. Mm-hmm. All right. So remember, this is a sliver of equity with a ton of debt ahead of it, basically. So it's going to be very, um, your outcome here, good or bad, is going to be very amplified versus how it really changes for the business. So can we look at the business description? Sure. All right. Okay. They provide table, uh, cable services to residential and commercial customers in the United States. It offers subscription-based video services, including video on demand, high-definition television, digital video recorder, pay-per-view. What are their brand names that they operate under? Do they say you? Um, uh, let's see. They don't say anyone. They sell local advertising across various platforms or networks, uh, such as MTV, CNN, ESPN. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'd have to analyze things in the 10 K and stuff about whether they own stakes and other things and stuff that might have value besides what we're seeing here. Um, it's a utility type thing like a railroad Mm -hmm. or a, um, or a utility. Uh, it's a lot of debt to have. So you have to be very sure about the future. A lot of value investors really like companies, um, in this space. Yeah. Well, it can work out very well for the equity Mm -hmm. because, um, if you do something smart, so it's mostly how intelligent is the management and you have such low, um, payments on your debt while well, you're able to create a lot of value for shareholders because the debt holders don't get paid a lot to take the kinds of risks that they're taking. Um, so that can be very attractive. Uh, I don't know enough in the long run about whether there will be risks to it. If something's going to get disrupted or something, then it's very, very dangerous and something like this than anything else. I would assume not. I mean, what do you think is the most utility-like thing? Do you think it is this now? Probably, yeah. All right, so, you know, um, yeah. You know, internet service and to some extent video. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Uh, Thoughts on companies spending more than 100% of their free cash flow on buybacks and dividends. Is this sustainable? 
No, it's obviously not sustainable, but it can be sustained for a f- certain number of years. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's not sustainable, but it could be sustained for a while. Uh, I don't I mean, I don't even know if I'd be for that, even if you were incredibly cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of them are doing it by borrowing more and more over time. Thoughts on it? Cash tag J O E. Was this oh, like the Joe's same, Crab Shack no, or something? It, no, it's, um, it's <laughs> the St. Joe company. company. It's a land. Yeah. <laughs> Operates real estate development, asset management, operating company in Northwest Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, you probably know more about Northwest Florida than I do. Yeah, maybe. Um, I have no idea the value of the land. So that, that's the main problem. Um, and I've looked at it before and stuff, but it's just, uh, you know, wh- why oh, the watercolor in hotel? That's right where we go all the time. Santa Rosa Beach. Yeah. Northern Florida, Dustin area. Okay. Well, they're, they're, I mean, long ago, I don't know if this is still the case. Their plan is to take stuff that was fairly not developed and turn it into things that look more like, I think, the rest of Florida. Mm. Um, they own a lot of land. How much does it say their acreage that they own? 115,000 acres. Yeah. And so some of it is, you know, those are pretty big developments that they have to have of it. Um, but uh, when we talk about things like whether we talk about, um, uh, cool KWL, the ticker, or Marilyn and Pineapple MLP. Um, th- there are reasons why I think I have a better idea of what the value of that land is. So the one is um, timberland in Upper Michigan, and then the the Upper Peninsula, and then um, the other one is resort land in West Maui. And there are dramatically different values on those things. Obviously, um, <clears throat> one's probably a thousand times more valuable per acre wow. than the other. But um, there are just reasons why I think you could value those things and figure it out. Some of the stuff like this could be very valuable, but I don't know. We get asked all the time about Texas um, land trust, uh, Texas specific land. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, same sort of thing. I, I've looked at the company. I don't have a good feel on it. This is the one that Berkowitz was involved with for a long time. I don't know if he still is. And Einhorn was shorted or did a presentation. Oh, really? I hmm. think so. Why do you use net income and not free cash flow when calculating return on equity? Uh, cash flow is what matters to me. Uh, it's not that you can't use net income sometimes, but net income doesn't really matter. Cash flow is what matters. Yep. Um, now, you know, cash flow has to be adjusted over time for all sorts of other things. So there are companies like that it work, makes more sense than um, free cash flow just in terms of measuring it. But the number you always want is owner earnings, which is what Buffett uses. And that number is closer to free cash flow. So I'd always use free cash flow instead of return on equity. And I also would use uh, like on an on leverage basis too. So if a company is leveraged, I really adjust it for how much uh, free cash flow they're generating relative to their net tangible assets in the business. Um, any thoughts on agriculture related stocks? Um, not really. What ones are they specifically asking about? ADM and TR. Uh, okay, so that's Arthur Daniels Midland, right? Yep. Uh, Archer Daniels Midland, sorry. And um, what's the other one? The other one, and TR. Uh, can you get, give me a business description? Of this sure. One? Produces and markets crop nutrients to agricultural, industrial, and feed customers worldwide. Okay, yeah. I mean, I've looked at some companies involved in agriculture to a little extent, but not much. Um, the only ones that I've looked at extensively enough to have any sort of real opinion on it is uh, Seaboard. If you could type in SEB, we can see that company. Um They've been involved in pork processing, um, milling, uh, a variety of different things over the years. I don't know how they're described here exactly. Um, and commodity trading. Yes. They've done all sorts of different things over the years into what they've moved into. Um, I would say pork has become a particularly big part of their business over time. Um, they obviously share turnover beta stuff fits more with our sort of approach. This is a very, very low key don't talk about the company, extremely private, sort of secretive kind of business. Um, and uh, I've looked at them. And so in the U.S., that's one they looked at. And then the other one they looked at extensively, which has some exposure to agriculture that we could type in is a- AGM, I guess. Mm. And this is um, Farmer Mac, also called Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporation. And on, in terms of upside downside sort of thing based on the numbers, I can't imagine that if you were bullish about agriculture generally, you'd do better in an actual agriculture company than in Farmer Mac. Um, I would think that if you wanted to bet heavily on things going well in agriculture in the U.S. for a long time, the best way to do it would be to buy Farmer Mac um, because it's priced so 
cheaply versus how much value it could create over time versus things like agriculture. So it's a very capital light business because it has a tremendous leverage. And so you're getting like if we look here, the PE is like six. Mm -hmm. And what's the growth been in like EPS and stuff in the last few years? Although it's kind of messy, probably one percent. That's not accurate. So um, if we look, we could look at asset growth, maybe. 13.5%. That's more accurate because it's a, it's a agriculture, it's a bank, uh, it's a financial services company. It works like a bank. It's a GSE. So agri so asset growth is the most realistic thing. So you're growing at 10% plus with a P of six, basically they pay out a significant dividend too. Um, so like what's the dividend most recently? Um, let's see. I mean, they have it right. Okay. I was just going to do dividend yield. Mm -hmm. It's 5% dividend years. What right. Well, what's right the now? dividend per share? Um, in 2019 it's bottom right about four lines up five lines up oh didn't even notice that two dollars and 80 cents okay and what's the earnings per share eight dollars and 29 cents okay so you can see that they're paying out a very meaningful they're only retaining what two-thirds or something of their earnings um while growing 10 percent a year that tells you that they have great growth and stuff mm -hmm. um it has to have very high core returns in the business um as you can see, that was a tremendously leveraged. And so this is a business that I think is kind of risky unless you have a great faith in management. There's two things that could go wrong. One is credit problems that management does something they shouldn't be doing. But the other one is an asset bubble in farmland, basically. If there is an asset bubble, my impression is the company will be wiped out. So there were asset bubbles twice in the U.S. in the last 100 years. If that same thing happened, that happened in basically, uh, they happened about 60 years apart each time. Um, if that kind of thing happened, I just feel this company is so leveraged that even if it thought it was doing smart things, it would fail in the same way that the GSEs that were related to housing failed in that bubble. So you have to watch out for a like twice every century asset bubble. And you also want to make sure that you like management to some extent here. Mm -hmm. But if I was going to buy an agriculture related thing, it would definitely be Farmer Mac. How do you think about reducing portfolio correlation, diversify across industries or asset classes? Uh, you should diversify across asset classes and particularly avoid things that are correlated to each other. So, um, uh, things that have significant beta and stuff like that, that might even be the most useful one is to own things that have. So beta is a combination of uh, of volatility and correlation. Mm -hmm. Those are the two factors that are involved in it. It's the product of those two factors. So when we talk about a low beta stock or something, the reason why you would look at a low beta stock is because it might have a low correlation, not just low volatility. Now you have to look for yourself whether it has low correlation with the market but some stocks do have low correlation with the market and so putting in more stocks that have lower correlation would be more useful um in terms of asset classes yes i would pick something that doesn't have um a correlation that's high in fact it may, might have a negative correlation and then you might want to rebalance um, based on that. So I think the example I gave before is like the most extreme example would be if you say had a portfolio that was like 20% on this side, um, long-term bonds, especially if you had long-term bonds that are um, zero coupon. And then in the middle, you have 60% stocks or something. And then on the other side, you have say 20% gold, something like that. And you rebalance them eventually. Th those sorts of things on the extreme sides there would actually be very um, non-correlated. And in fact, they might be inversely correlated at times. So probably things that are extremely different, probably that would mean something like gold, like a pure asset type thing. And something that's a pure cash flow, which would be something like a very long-term bond. Um, you could also hold some cash that actually, obviously the correlation is going to be that it doesn't matter what's going on with the stock market. It's not going to affect the price of your cash. How does he feel about Pabrai, Spear and Watsa investing in India as the economy to invest in? And how does he feel about Fairfax financial holdings at current prices as a vehicle for it? Uh, I don't know about the second one. I think that if they know stuff about India, um, that's a good place. I talked to some people who are invested in India and some of them, in fact, used to invest a lot in the U S they know a lot more about India. Uh, these are people who, uh, yeah, in all cases are people who've spent a significant part of their life in India. Um, and they just think that the values are much better there than they are here. And then wouldn't surprise me if they are, I don't know enough about India myself to be able to invest intelligently there, but if you know about it, then I'd say it sounds good. What are your preferred ways, favorite online resources of finding out the bond prices of the listed companies you invest in? That's a tremendously difficult thing to do. And the companies we invest in don't have bonds. They're too small. It's not hard to do if you pay a price. Mm -hmm. It's the yeah, free for part. For free. Yeah. It's the free part. It's hard, yeah. <laughs> um, thoughts on land slash middle right companies that lease and collect royalties from Met 
coal producers. I think they're very interesting, and I would like them a lot better than a met coal producer. So I think I talked a little bit about that before. We talked about inflation. If you want to be protected against inflation, good things to look at are trusts or things that are royal, especially trusts, things that own royalties, but you have confidence won't buy more of those royalties. So like they have mineral rights, but they won't buy more mineral rights or something like that. Yeah. So uh, that sort of thing, it has made a past investment that you didn't make. You're now buying into it. But that also works for things like we mentioned Mills Music Trust or something. It could be anything. It could be music. It could be mineral rights. It could be land, whatever. But they're not going to put more into it. So, yeah, there are a few um, publicly traded uh, vehicles that include um, rights for uh, that include royalties that you get. And then you just have to learn about them, though, because their royalties sometimes are quite different. They can have royalties that are percentage based things or things that have royalties that are just overrides at certain price things like um, uh, some of them don't necessarily adjust for inflation and stuff. So it, they're dramatically different depending on the exact terms of their rights, how that would affect it if there was like a big increase in the price of the, the um, commodity that you're looking at. Um, due to the pandemic effect, do you think companies that its stock had declined should be aggressively buying back stocks or preserve cash? Take Omicom, for example. They have history of high buy, a history of a high buyback rate, but they just announced that they will suspend their buybacks, even though the price now is much lower than when they made the buybacks. Or should they borrow more and use it for buying back their stock? I don't think anyone should do buybacks. Um, like right now or in general? What do you mean by that? Right now. There's a few reasons why you don't want to do buybacks. Um, one is that the there's a s very significant risk that by buying back stock at a current price, you might end up losing money because you have to issue equity later at a price that's lower than the price at which you're buying back. Mm -hmm. Two, the buyback might be done in a way that endangers your ability to borrow, which is problematic. And then three, it's bad from a PR perspective to be doing a buyback during uh, coronavirus. So I would say that I would uh, suggest that uh, no company does buybacks in the middle of the pandemic. I, for some companies... But your first rule of thumb would be just so they could preserve cash and not have to... I mean, it wouldn't be... PR, right? Like that wouldn't be your first reason for it. For an advertising agency, PR is a very significant issue. Okay, for advertising. So I'd be careful. I mean, because they did that back in 2008, right? But that was yes. different with their options. But and there's, stuff like no, that. there's no public relations problem with that, mm. right? Um, I, I just think that there's, I mean, so yeah, now they did buy back stock, mm -hmm. but they actually ended up issuing even more to people because they asked all their top people, uh, like top, not just top few people, but top few hundred people to receive less in guaranteed pay and in exchange be paid a lot more in stock, which is very valuable to them. I mean, some people in Omnicom, I think, made a ton of money from that. I, I, I'm different than most people on this one. Most of my best stuff. I'm very I don't wouldn't want to see companies that we own and stuff do buybacks during the uh, during COVID because I think it's tremendously risky to use cash that you have. Um, to further be in risk of breaching covenants and things too, and doing other things like that at a time when um, you might want the cash later. Mm. So I would be really, really cautious about doing that. And I think there's a significant PR problem for some companies. So for things, even if the regulars didn't tell them, things like banks and uh, stuff like that would have problems doing it. And uh yeah, it's I just I would avoid it, especially because for many companies, it doesn't even matter that much because how much stock could you buy back mm -hmm. given how what the prices were and for how long and all that sort of thing. Now, for some companies, it, it, they're very liquid and they happen to have a lot of cash. It's a different story. But for most, I don't I think it's fine to not do buybacks in life in general and in investing. How do you make a decision? What is your decision making process and certainty and how much of it relies on past experience? I read thinking in bets, but all I got from it was that an output of a decision doesn't mean it was a bad or a good one. Yeah, that's important. The, the result of the decision doesn't mean it's a good or bad one. I think that's the most important thing I do when looking at management. I'm fine with um, companies that made uh, that made mistakes mm -hmm. uh, by analyzing it based on the results and things. We own stock in NACO, another company that um, did acquisitions at one time that didn't work out uh, going back five or 10 years. And uh, in both cases, I'm fine with it because it looked like it was fairly close to their circle of competence of what they would do. The terms looked pretty good. It looked like a good time to do it. It made all the sense that you would think, and then it didn't work out, mm -hmm. which is very different than someone buying something I think is outside their circle of competence at the top of the market, doing it in a way that I think is kind of risky, stuff like that, you know? So uh, that's an important part of it. And then I think the other part is when you're, before you say something, 
um, consider would I bet on it? And what would that bet be, you know? So even things that are, um, to use a politically incorrect example, let's say, or a, a not, a, a, well, whatever you would call it. Um, you know, if someone asked me about like, how many people do you think will die from COVID and stuff? Um, the thing is, at what point would you take that bet at even money? And at what point um, would you on both sides of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've said before that uh, I thought it's very unlikely that there's any way less than 130,000 people in the US would die from it. But I also thought it was very unlikely that more than 1.3 million would die. And a way of thinking about that is, would you take that bet? I mean, would you take a bet really that few, you know, would you take an even money bet on that? Or would you say, oh, I need to be paid five, 10, whatever times more. And I think the biggest problem for most people is if they think something has like a 51% probability, um, they're like, yes, I would, I would do that. Mm -hmm. And yet in reality, you wouldn't bet on something like that. So you shouldn't have that much confidence. The most important concept to me from thinking in bets is where they talk about confidence calibration. And that is the most important thing. It's very important to know the difference when someone says they think something's likely often it may be there's a 30% chance or something of it. And they talk a little bit about thinking in bets about, um, she talks a little bit about things like, uh, or let's put it this way. I'll say this things like Brexit and, uh, Trump being elected. The people were stunned by this and stuff in each case. There's no reason why they should have been stunned. All good models of what might happen in terms of the differences they had and how tight polling was would have suggested to you that there was easily a one out of four, one out of five chance mm. that this would happen. And one out of four and one out of five chances happen all the time. So, I mean, something like that should happen every fourth or fifth election. So if you think about it, you're going to be stunned every time there's a one out of five outcome. Mm -hmm. But what happened is people build around a consensus, which is, yes, it was more likely that, um, uh, that Remain would have won and it was more likely that Clinton would have won. But that shouldn't become shocking because all these different things predicted this within a confidence level that isn't all that tremendously high. There's still a very high chance that the other thing will happen. Very high. We're not talking about like um, black swan events and things. These are very high percentages. And um, you're going to be stunned every few elections, which means that every, you know, by the way that people reacted to those elections, every 20 years, you're going to wake up shocked that this thing could have happened mm -hmm. because it's predicted to happen yeah. about once every 20 years that, this sh that you'll have an outcome like that. So uh, that's an important part of thinking in bets is the confidence calibration. We tend not to do things that are close to 50% in terms of what I do. The things that I bet on are on a much higher level of confidence than that. And I think it's also getting... To the, con to the confidence point of even if the investment does not work out or if the decision does not work out, you probably would still take it over and over again because with the information that you had, the facts that you had, mm -hmm. it made sense you know, at the time. Yeah, lots of people, I think, learn the wrong lessons from their mistakes because they may not have been mistakes. They worked out badly. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way Buffett handles mistakes and stuff is the best and how he talked about airlines and stuff. Um, I think people can learn the wrong lessons from that like it was a bad industry so it shouldn't be in and stuff. There's a small element of that because in other businesses there's more, um, there would have been more uh, room for error there. But honestly, it was because of an event happening, a, a pandemic that he couldn't foresee and stuff like that, which will happen sometimes and will wipe out certain businesses when it does happen. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on BWXT? Uh, okay, well, let's go to QuickFS and look at it. So this is um, the company that was spun off. Well, I just sort of the remaining company of Babcock and Wilcox. So it was Babcock and Wilcox, um, whatever, five years or so ago. And then this is the defense part of it that's left. Um, so it's big thing is nuclear reactors for the U.S. Navy and other things related to that. If you can do the business description, it can tell us. It's mainly stuff related to uranium. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's attractive as a business. But I think you have to be careful about not paying up for it. Those numbers aren't good because of the spinoff and stuff. So just so people know, those aren't realistic numbers. We can look in the last few years, though. So at the point where you see the spinoff, you should start seeing... When did um, the spinoff happen? Well, we can see that in the numbers. So if we look... 2013, it depends on like. their. Yeah, it depends on their... Um, we'll just use the last three years because that's clean. So if we use the last three years, you can see what is their operating margin in the last three years? 16.5%, um, 15%, 15.8%. Okay, and so what's their return 15. on invested capital the last three years? Um, return on invested capital, 26%, 29%, 23%. That's probably including stuff that isn't tangible, though. But... Um, 
the, so the problem that you can see is if you look at the operating margin, you're basically trading at like, I don't know, about 20 times pre-tax earnings or something normally. They could achieve a somewhat higher operating margin in certain years, but not much. I don't think they can exceed 17% or so with the government really. So um, I just think it's not super cheap, but they might apply some leverage to it. And so it's fine. I mean, compared to the market generally, it has less risk. And it has probably similarly priced and stuff. I mean, would I rather buy this than the S&P 500 or than FANG stocks or than whatever if they're similarly priced? Probably. But you can see the price. Uh, just as an example, you can look at EV to EBITDA. That's a really high EV to EBITDA, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's fine. If some business deserves it, it's this one. But I'd just be cautious. Remember, I bought this stock in the 20s. And what's it at now? Uh, it is at 57. Right. So, you know, it's less attractive than when I looked at it uh, just because it hasn't improved that much in value. Um, next question, when doing coefficient of variation on margins, which would be the most appropriate gross margin, EBITDA, EBITDA, or EBIT? I would say whatever you, sample size you want to do, just do it. I mean, yeah, gross so margins, the, EBITDA, I mean, whatever you want. Right, so it's a dimensionless it. number you can compare to other things. So you can do it for all of them. In Excel and stuff, there's no reason why you can't do it for all. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of uh, persistency in terms of the predictability long term and stuff the honest answer is that gross margins and gross profitability so gross margins and turns are the things that are most predictive probably gross margins for a business in the very very long term are the most predictive so if you asked me with no other choice no other information about it you had a startup i didn't know about and stuff um you didn't let me know what kind of business it was and you showed me their gross margins over the last 10 years or, or so um that would be the number that's most useful to me in predicting the long-term future of the company, whether it has competitive advantages, whether it's likely to be somewhat predictable, stuff like that is actually gross margin, even though that's the one that people look at the least. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on EGY, a small EMP oil company trading below cash with no debt, operational break even at $30, $32 per barrel. I can't uh, talk today. Okay, so we can put that in on QuickFS. And if you sign up for QuickFS, put in the... Folks there we go, Jeff. Code. Pitch, pitch. That's right. Um, Always selling. But, Let's go. All right. So we'll look at. There's no it. code. It's in the survey afterwards. It's Just click, the, click the yeah. bubble. Focus okay. on um, So let's see. Uh, I have no way of evaluating whether that's true or not about the break even. That's just something someone said, the company said. Yeah. The, they said on Twitter, it could be true, could be not true. We'll see. I mean, everything the, people says on Twitter is true. the bank when they, when they say those things, you know, they'll say our loans are good at this, um, you know, crude oil price. And then so they we blow put up. this into our model, you know, <laughs> so I don't know. Um, so if we look at the balance sheet. Yep. Okay. Isn't it so nice that you could get all this information in one place? Wow. Quick yeah. FS, sign up. So Sheesh. Total liabilities? Total liabilities. 102 million. And total current assets. 70 million. 46 um, is cash. Yeah. Hmm. Total assets is 212 million. What and 102 of that is four of the liabilities. And we don't know. It's capital leases and other liabilities, a significant portion of yeah. what are they in? Um, yeah. So. And accrued liabilities, 30 million. Yeah. So, so my concern is the current ratio is poor here. You got a bad current ratio. I prefer to see a stronger current ratio. So I prefer to see a higher, I should say, I should prefer to see a higher ratio between current assets and total liabilities, not uh, current assets and current liabilities. So that's one part of it. But then the other part is um, we'd have to know things about the property plan and equipment net. Mm -hmm. um, so that's significant. So what's our uh, total assets uh, are what? 212 million. And that's okay. And total liabilities... 102 million, no debt other than, you know, capital leases. So we're at, okay. Um, I mean, look, it, I don't know when they bought, we could look here and stuff about when they bought these assets and, and stuff like that in terms of property planning equipment net. But if you're priced to your working capital, if your market cap is less than your working capital or your market cap is less than two thirds or so of, of somewhat marketable, tangible assets. Yeah. And their market cap's 56 million. Right then I would be pretty interested. This doesn't look shockingly cheap. We have a price to book of one, for instance. Um, but it could be that the assets are, that may not be meaningful. The assets may be uh, worth quite a lot compared to what it says um, there, depending on when they acquired them and all that. On the other hand, the price to book of something that bought everything two years ago would be, uh, you know, we wouldn't want it at one and a half times book. So let's look at the business description where it is. Sure. Um, 
independent energy company acquires, explores for, develops, and produces crude oil and natural gas. The company holds, let's see, uh, production, where's this? Sharing contract related. Where's that? Equatorial Guinea. Yeah, where's that? Yeah, so this is probably not one I'd be interested in. Why is that? Just because of the location or where the assets are. West Africa. Yeah, I I mean, we actually were talking about a company that had a spinoff thing from stuff that was involved with West Africa and stuff. I don't know if you remember. And the spinoff thing was the thing I was interested in, which it was in uh, gas stations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Let's see. What is the most underrated and overrated metrics of a stock? Most overrated is P.E., and most underrated and and that's why because as an investor right so if you own the business i think when people talk about like metrics and stuff like this it's too super superficial in a way all you care about as a business owner take the fact that it's a stock all you wouldn't necessarily care about the earnings all you'd care about is the cash flow and the cash flow Mm -hmm. you could take out of the business that's it right that's cash flow is a livelihood of any company Mm -hmm. stop thinking about like as a being a stock um and I get why people use it. I mean, we look at P, of course, all the time. It's just a good starting place for us. But if you have noticed, everything we talk about, it always has to deal with owner's earnings of some sort, you know, free cash flow, mm-hmm. the true cash that you could take out of a business. Yeah. So the P, the problem with it is it's a one-year number. It bounces around a lot. It's after tax, after all those things. It's not a cash number, and it's not adjusted for leverage. So it's got a lot of problems. Yeah. Um, probably enterprise value to gross profit would be the most undervalued. Uh, do you include acquisitions slash divestments on CapEx when calculating free cash flow? If not, how do you account for it when valuing companies that mainly grow inorganically? You can do it either way. You can either value them by looking at them as if they don't do the acquisitions and how much do they actually grow, like pretend they're not going to acquire anything. Or you could do it by factoring in the acquisitions as if they're growth stuff. Factoring in the acquisitions as if they're growth stuff is really tricky because um, it's very possible a company can buy something, it looks okay, and then over a few years it deteriorates. So that's the biggest problem with a serial acquirer. If they take over business, do they improve it or do they make it worse or does it, there no change? You know, At Berkshire, there's usually no change as long as Buffett hasn't um, made a mistake in terms of deciding what to buy. But companies that try to do stuff with them, Valiant, Transdime, things like that, could make them a lot better, mm. could make them somewhat worse, could do you know whatever. So it, it depends on stuff like that. So it, it really does depend on the what they do afterwards, which for companies that are serial acquirers, because the acquisitions keep getting bigger and bigger all the time, like I was talking about Middleby, which I think is very hard to figure out whether the acquisitions deteriorated or not after they bought them, because what they're doing is each acquisition they're making is basically bigger than the last one, you know, over time. So by doing that, it kind of masks the importance of the acquisition they just made. So an acquisition that sounds important now, a few years later, I can't really learn about what happened with it. Mm-hmm. So, so much of it is in the acquisition that it's hard to evaluate what's happening in the underlying business. And so I, I would generally say you don't count the acquisition because it's so lumpy, but then you don't give them credit for any growth that is inorganic but that would eliminate entire groups of companies that people like a lot including it would make it difficult to value something like berkshire hathaway obviously what's your view on y-shaped recovery post-covid meaning some business models completely dying and some new models coming due to consumer behavioral changes i think the long-term consumer behavioral changes won't be that big yeah i would agree with that some things it will be we'll see i mean buffett talked a lot about like um real estate that people lease for things, including stuff like offices and stuff. And that's true because that's so um, a question of supply and demand. So, you know, if there's even just a small decrease in that, that's a big change, just like in air travel. So if, if demand for office space drops 10%, then you've gone from a situation where you had pretty good pricing on office space till you don't have enough of it. But those are things that like you'll work out over time. Then you'll just build less office space. So it's not a huge um, change. Any good recommendations for manuals of Korean stocks? No. As Americans, can you buy CND stocks in your Roth IRA? If yes, have you looked at CWX? Uh, no. no. Um, thoughts on FL? Okay. Was that Foot Locker? Floor? Foot Locker. Okay. Foot Locker, currently trading EV to free cash flow four times. Not a surprise. Retail in a lot of malls. Yeah. There's carnage going on there. Um, they're an athletic shoe and apparel retailer. I mean, I personally would just probably just say. EV to sales is 0.3. Yeah. Um, so this is interesting. I've been looking at a few companies. 
shoe retail and shoe companies in general seem among the cheapest things in America I can find. And it's unclear to me why they're so cheap. In some cases, they've been cheap despite the fact the business doesn't deserve to be cheap. This is perhaps one of those examples because the numbers that we're seeing don't make any sense. With it. So, like, for instance, what's the operating margin um, been on the last 10 years? It looks like it's... Okay, so you want the uh, 10-year medium... Uh, 10%. Okay, and what's the lowest it's been? Lowest operating margin, it looks like 5% in 2011. Okay, and what is it now? 9%. Okay, so you have an EV to sales that says that's way too low. So it should normally have an EV to sales of about 1%. Here it's 0.3, so that's a little interesting. Same with price to sales, should be about three times what it is. So there's a heavy discounting of it where it's being priced at about one third of what other companies not doing what they're doing would normally be priced at. Mm -hmm. um, are people gonna keep buying shoes offline in malls and stuff? Probably. Something that people like to try on and stuff? Yeah, and it's, I don't know how, it's not a lot easier for them to sell it more cheaply online than offline. So unless there's a big factor about convenience, you don't buy on a reorder for it. It's pretty infrequent what the purchases are. Um, so it, among many things that look interesting that way, I, I, we could go through all sorts of them. I just think that um, this isn't our kind of stock. You can see high share turnover, high beta, all of that kind of stuff. But I have noticed that things that are related to shoes seem um, surprisingly cheap, and I don't know why. <clears throat> Tip for you, oil royalties. He gives a ticker. Um says it's hard to find any correlation between past and future performance for most fund managers suggesting any success is mostly due to luck do you see any differentiating factor for successful investors such as buffett graham greenblatt etc compared to other professionals it depends on what you mean um i think that's not necessarily the conclusion you should come to just because there's low correlation between uh some past series of numbers and future series that that means that the past series was due to luck it may not be um the most common reason for both businesses and asset managers i think for poor performance in the future than in the past is a combination of one of uh, the three things one luck two cyclical factors in the stocks that they are their strategy being in favor and three um growth in their number of assets so basically looking for fund managers whose assets haven't grown but their performance has been strong would be the best that's very very hard to find in the industry because money flows to the people who have the good past performance whether or not that's sustainable over time so if someone like shut down their fund and went and opened a smaller fund or something the chance that they would have really good performance i think is much much higher than you might think so if you had someone go from a hundred million dollars to a billion and then they said oh i'm opening up a 10 million dollar fund um I think you'd be doing a lot better than having chances that it's just due to luck if you did that. No one does that. And so you're having that skewed by the fact that performance is so much worse on larger um, basis of assets. The other thing is don't pick a fund manager whose performance was good because they were in their style was in favor. So it's a mistake to pick a growth fund manager right now. Don't do it. Just don't look at growth fund managers. Only look at value managers. Um, and then if you want to pick a very strong value manager who, let's say, has not been growing their assets a lot, then that would be a good choice. Then after that value manager performs well and stuff, make sure that you don't pick someone then because they were, uh, you know, value things. So the time to buy a growth manager or something would have been in the early 80s. Uh, the time to buy a value manager is like now. Um, so you want to see someone who has strong performance that's specific to their um, their actual stock picking mm -hmm. and isn't due to their uh, their style being in favor. And the most important thing of all is you want smaller asset bases. But this is true also for companies. If you find a really good company, be very careful about a company that's been growing its assets by 20% a year for the last 10 years. It's going to be almost impossible for them to repeat that performance. They could be really good, but they'll never again be as good as they were probably 10 years ago. That's too fast to grow your assets. Same with fund managers. Um, Buffett's performance has gotten worse almost every decade. And his performance would be a lot better now if he could go back to managing such little amounts of money as he was in the 50s. Mm -hmm. How much emphasis slash weighting does Jeff place on management compensation slash ownership? Any examples of companies that Jeff really liked but passed on due to misaligned incentives? Um, that's a good question. I mean, look, if if a CEO owns 20% of the company, yeah. I mean, he's, chances are they're not going to, you're going to wake up one day and see this massive dilution or something like that. Crazy. Right. 
so the the most the best thing would be large share ownership with low um, pay. I mean, like a Buffett, for example. Yeah. So it's weird why you would end up with that, but large share ownership with low pay is the best thing. They bought their uh, stock in the open market and stuff like that, but they're almost more like an investor if they do that. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of compensation, if there are ones where I didn't like it, yes. There are cases where I like the asset, but I don't like management. And it's because of how they're paying themselves. Um, we were just talking about this yesterday, for example. Mm-hmm. Let's say they don't own a lot of the stock. Right. Let's say they think their business is going to significantly deteriorate. Maybe they're going to be less quickly to um, you know, change guidance on their company or something because maybe mm-hmm. they are paid in bonuses and stuff like right. that as opposed to equity. You know? yeah, so there is some forms of incentive compensation that I'd be totally against. Um, we're not going to name names, but things like targets of how much our stock trades at. I'd yeah. be against that. <laughs> um, because it's such bad incentives, but there are also bad incentives for sales. Thing. I mean, that's the incentives at Wells Fargo. If you incentivize people for having opening accounts or whatever, then they'll open fake accounts. If you incentivize people for making their stock pop, um, then they'll make it pop regardless of whether uh, the performance of the business is good or not. I mean, I would prefer... That ever, you know, if I could choose what the incentive compensation would be, I would prefer that people be paid almost entirely in stock that they cannot get rid of until they leave the business or that they can only sell off at an incredibly low rate, like 5% or something while they're a year. Um, so basically they're tied in until they leave the company and would be in the form of free cash flow divided by net tangible assets. So like if they're paid $100,000 a year, I would like their bonus to be 40% a year or something if the return was 40% a year. Uh, it was 40% this year or something. You know, almost a one-for-one one combination that way. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't... I, I don't think I pay as much attention to it as other people necessarily. I think other people think it's very, very important what incentives are. I think incentives are important, but for top management, incentives may be less important than for almost all other levels of the company. In fact, I think they are. Because I think management is tied up in big ways that don't have to do with ego, uh, that don't have to do with income, that may have to do with ego for that. I mean, we've talked about it even with things with people talk to us about, oh, does this compensation thing align more with your client's interest or is this one? I mean, the incentives to have strong performance relative to other fund managers is so high without any sort of incentive compensation anyway, yeah, just, that it's almost unnecessary to add more to that. Now, so then if you do add more, does it almost become a, a an improper incentive because you're almost going too far in that direction? Just like with management, if you're going too far in the direction of, say, EPS growth or something, does it actually become that they start to take higher risks and things, mm-hmm. you know, like that? So I don't think you need to incentivize management to kind of do things that would make them very successful anyway. Um but I think there's certain things with management incentives usually that aren't um, obvious to us, like their reputation in the industry, whether, you know, their care about other people and like um, that might be employees of the company, might be um, all sorts of other people that for some will be so important and for some not very important at all. And that usually has to do with things like, did you found the company? Is it a family company? Are you a major shareholder? Are you a professional manager that came in here and you think you're going to leave eventually? Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's lots of other incentives that aren't in the numbers. So to me, I would say if you're looking like, do you incentives matter as much for a CEO incentive compensation does the way you create the incentive comp uh, plan going to matter as much to the CEO of a company as it will or let's say chairman and CEO of a company as it will to your average salesman no it will matter much more to the salesman Mm -hmm. because the salesman has far less um, non financial incentives tied up with the company uh, whereas the CEO will always be pulled in a bunch of different ways from uh, that don't have to do with money. There's just incentives that he has you can't get rid of. Um, he will associate himself with the company. Think of it as his company and stuff. Think about things that have to do with reputation, comparing himself to other people, whatever things that just aren't the same with uh, other people in the organization. So I think it matters, but I think incentives lower in the organization matter a lot more. I think how you incentivize your GMs is gonna matter a lot more than how you incentivize your CEO and chairman. My favorite story on incentives is one that Munger actually tells a lot about FedEx Mm -hmm. and how at one point FedEx, for whatever reason, the the night shift or the overnight shift, they kept losing packages, they kept, um, stuff was going out late, Mm -hmm. it was just a huge cluster and the employees were paid per hour. And what they did was they they started paying employees per shift. Let's say, for example,
example, you started at midnight and you finished at 3 a.m. Well, you were paid as if you finished at 6 a.m. Yeah. And what that did is it allowed people to, I guess, hold other people accountable to get the job done correctly, to work more as a team. And they mm-hmm. said it was like a night and day change. Yeah. Exactly. And so what I'm saying is like, you know, um, Tandy, which uses like, I think historically they use 25% of the EBIT of the store for their store managers. I think they've changed it somewhat. They're going to include other things. Um, it, that incentive matters probably more than how the CEO is compensated. Um, you know, Carmart uses for their car buyers, they tie it in some way to the performance of the car, of those specific cars. For the people who make loans, they tie it specifically to the performance of those loans over time. Those kinds of incentives are likely to be a lot more effective, I think, than the CEO. Um, incentives because the CEO just has, it, it depends on the company, but in many cases, the CEO has pretty strong incentives to do certain things and avoid certain risks and also just avoid certain things that are so unpleasant to them and what they have to do. Like the CEOs have very strong incentives not to get rid of underperforming businesses, even if you give them pretty high incentives to tell them to get rid of the underperforming businesses for all sorts of human things to other things. It's just not what they want to do. And so maybe if you heavily incentivize them to cut bad parts of the business out, that would be really effective. I don't know, but there's certain things that are very hard for them to do no matter how much you incentivize them. On the other hand, like growing the business, you don't usually need to incentivize them to do that. Mm -hmm. Like growing the top line, they're going to want to manage a bigger and bigger business no matter what. Sure. Uh, since the Fed has started buying bond ETFs, what will become of value investing if they begin to buy stock ETFs? I assume we won't see large corrections that would give us good companies at bargain prices anymore. Uh, I don't know. People ask about this all the time. Look, yeah. if the Fed starts doing something, eventually they'll stop doing it. So, <laughs> I mean, so it depends on what you mean. In the short run, will it be a problem. In the long run, will it not? I mean, indexing has caused that in stocks and things. They're not going to buy the stocks that we would buy anyway. So it would cause the stocks that we buy to be priced lower versus other sorts of stocks. And in the long run, that would mean that the things that they're not buying will outperform the things that they are buying. Would it make sense to have a strategy to figure out what things the Fed might buy and to particularly buy those things that are basically the same as the things the Fed are, is buying, but not what the Fed is buying, you know, to find things that are most heavily correlated with them mm-hmm. in from a business perspective, but actually not from a financial market perspective in the baskets that they would buy. Yes, that's probably what would make the most sense in the long run is to try to duplicate what kinds of things they would buy, but can't buy because there'll be a a sort of very long term arbitrage situation there in which you're having things for no business reason go Mm -hmm. up. That's the big thing is that usually what will work in the very long run is there's a non business reason for why some asset is going up and definitely buying by a central bank or something is or the perception among market participants that the central bank will buy that thing, even if they don't, um, that will push up some things inappropriately versus other things. And so it makes more sense in the long run to buy the thing that they won't buy than to buy the thing that they will buy. In the short run, it makes sense to buy the thing that they will buy. And a lot of people will try to do that and it will work until it stops working. Well, and on that note, <laughs> I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself in today's podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. If you want to use the software that we had used in this episode to look at financial statements, go to quickfs.net. If you sign up, it's $35 per month. It's a great platform, great website. Uh, make sure you tell them that you came from Focus Compounding. Well, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you in the next podcast.